Uh, Grace in the Book of Romans, that's the uh, title of the series that we're doing. This is lesson number 10 in that series. And the title of this particular lesson is Saved Yet Struggling. And we will try to cover chapter seven, verses one to 25 in the book of Romans. All right, so far uh, in our discussion of this uh, epistle, Paul uh, the apostle has explained how God's renewed offer of grace has saved man from sin and the condemnation of the law. Now Paul answers several probable questions based on his teaching of saved by grace through faith. So he calculates that there may be some questions coming to him after he's uh, written a part of this epistle and so he kind of answers questions uh, that his readers, that he thinks his readers may have. In chapter seven he's going to deal with another question and provide his own experience as the answer to that question. So in, chapter, uh, in this chapter he asks the question, if I'm saved and under grace, then why do I continually struggle with sin? Why is that happening to me? In other words, if I'm in the power of grace, why am I still tempted by sin? So in chapter six he explains that in baptism one dies with Christ and we resurrect to a new experience in Christ. Remember I said there's a new experience of life that an individual has in Christ. And I explained what Paul said that experience was like. He called it, quote, eternal life. And we kind of broke that down. What is that experience of eternal life that we have in Christ, in the spirit? Okay, so in chapter seven, he's going to go on to explain that this new life is not without its problems and struggles. Now, there's been a, a long debate here uh, about whether Paul is speaking of his former life here in chapter seven, or if he's describing his present life, his present experience as a Christian. And you know, there are sincere arguments for both sides. Personally, I believe that Paul is speaking of his present state and uh, I believe that for two reasons. First of all, the entire section deals with the new life that one experiences upon being buried with Christ in baptism. Remember back in chapter six, that, that's what he's talking about. So Paul is continuing this descri uh, description of his new life. Now chapter six, in chapter six, he's talking about the upside of this new life, the good part of this new life. And what is that? Well, freedom from fear, freedom from death, power in the Holy Spirit and so on. That's the good side, that's the upside. Now in chapter seven, he's going to describe the downside of this new life. The downside, the thing that he experiences when the duality of man's natures collide. The new man in Christ inside the old man of flesh. So that's one reason I believe that he's talking about his present experience. Number two, in verse 25 he summarizes the entire chapter in the present tense, suggesting that the experience he describes in chapter seven is one that he is now undergoing. Okay. So chapter seven is really a chapter that could be entitled Saved, yeah. Yet Struggling. And that's the feature of all Christians. So Paul tells the Romans we are saved and salvation is real and you can, you, know, you, can, uh, you can see it in your lives. However, while you are in the flesh you will still struggle with sin. And chapter seven describes this struggle in his own life. Now in chapter eight He's going to offer the solution to this problem, how God helps the individual. But in chapter seven, he just describes the problem. So the essential problem that Christians face, which Paul explains here, is that in becoming united to Christ and having a new life, we're no longer subject to the law in judgment, that's true, but we are still influenced by the law in effect. It still has an effect on us. In other words, the law no longer condemns us before God, 
but it still has the power to affect our lives while we are here on earth. Let me try one more you know, kick at the can. In still, other words, the law cannot touch us in heaven, but it still causes us to suffer here on earth. Because we're, you know, we're in this body of flesh. We're, we're still human, right? So this idea of being free from the law, Paul explains in chapter seven, beginning in verse one. So let's read that together. He says, or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning her husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Therefore, my brethren, you, are, uh, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. So he uses an analogy here of marriage to show that the law has limits. You know, the law governed marriage until a partner died, after which the person was beyond the law. Not beyond God, of course, but simply beyond the law. In the same way, he says, if a person died with Christ, they are beyond the law, not beyond God. So those in Christ have another power source. Their power source is grace, not the law. So let's keep going, verses seven to 12. He says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So then, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. So in verses seven to 12, the apostle reassures his readers that just because one is beyond the law doesn't mean that the law has failed or that the law is somehow imperfect. On the contrary, he says, the law has done its job. It has convicted Paul of sin and made him aware that he was condemned. That, that's the job of the law and it succeeded. So this is the essential purpose of the law in its relationship with man, to convict and to condemn, and ultimately, ultimately to lead one to Christ. Because if we're convicted by the law, recognize that we're convicted by the law, recognize that we'll be condemned by the law, we're supposed to be searching for a way out. We're supposed to be searching for salvation. And of course, the gospel is the answer to that. So in doing its job, the law remains perfectly suited to what it was created for. It is perfect, it is holy, it is without fault. It works perfectly. Paul says. Now, in the final section, he's going to describe the nature of the struggle that takes place within himself as a saved spirit dwelling inside a sinful flesh that is not judged by the law anymore, but still affected by it. Okay? This is why Christians you know, sometimes feel guilty. So let's read verse 13. He says, therefore, uh, uh, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be, rather it was sin, in order that it might be shown to be sin by effecting my death throughout 
excuse me, through that which is good, so that through the commandment sin would become utterly sinful. So first of all, he says, or rather he makes another rhetorical question which asks, how can something good and holy, which is the law, how can something good and holy cause death? How does that happen? So he answers that it isn't the law that causes death, it's sin that causes death. The law merely exposes sin by holding it up to the light of perfection and it condemns sin by revealing God's response to sin. That's what the law does. That's what the commandments do. They show you where you've gone wrong and they show you the consequences of that. We have to understand that the law doesn't cause the suffering and death experienced by the flesh. It is a diagnostic tool that God uses to show us what does cause this misery, which is sin. It's the same way, you know, the x-ray isn't the thing that causes the cancer. And it's not the cure for the cancer either, right? It only reveals the cancer that an individual may be suffering from. Now, when the x-ray reveals the tumor, that's when the anguish begins, right? And the suffering, as long as you didn't know you had it, you're wandering around, you're fine, you're doing a little pain in my side, oh, I got a sore back, oh, I must have sprained a muscle, but you're doing everything that you're doing, fine. And then finally, your sore back, your doctor says, you know, well, let's take a look at that. Maybe you've got a bulging disc, or you know, let's, let's take a look at that. And they take a look at that and say, oh, you, you, have, a, you have a cancerous tumor on your spine. What happens then? <laughs> well, that's when the worry starts, right? That's when the anguish begins. That's when the suffering begins. The x-ray has revealed the problem. Well, it's the same thing spiritually. The law has revealed the problem. That's when the anguish begins. So let's read 14 to 17. He says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I, I am not practicing, what I would like to do. But I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. So Paul explains the struggle here from a personal perspective. And he notes several things about this struggle. First of all, the essential reason for the struggle is that a regenerated spirit dwells in a sinful shell of flesh. That's the problem. The regenerated spirit recognizes and desires to practice the law, but the sinful flesh undermines any attempt to do so. So what makes the struggle so painful is that a Christian is aware of this dichotomy at all times. I know this is going on inside of me. Haven't you ever had that experience? You're going along, you're doing you know, nothing, nothing bad, and then all of a sudden you, this thought hits you and it kind of goes down a, you know, a rabbit hole and you're thinking, wow, how could I have even thought of such a thing? How could I even think such a thing? You know, you're, you're, you're talking to yourself. So when he says that he is no longer the one doing it, Paul doesn't you know, reject personal responsibility for his sins because of his struggle. He means that when he sins, he has failed to do what he really wants to do. And what he really wants to do is obey God's law. So sin has a victory here over the flesh, but not over his spirit. Okay, that's what he's saying. That's one for that team. But it has not dominated him. And it's still his flesh that's acting and not his spirit. In other words, he's identifying the root cause of why he's thinking or doing what he's not wanting to do. So we keep reading in verse 18. He says, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil I do not want. 
But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. Verse 22, he says, for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. So in these verses, Paul describes the outcome of this struggle between the regenerated spirit, his spirit, his Christian spirit, and his flesh. First, he says he sees clearly the desire of his regenerated spirit to do God's perfect and holy will. And also he sees clearly his sinful flesh's unwillingness to respond. I know the right thing to do in this situation, but I have to drag this flesh of mine kicking and screaming you know, to the right thing. So this struggle in him brings to light the opposite forces at work in his nature. Secondly, he also sees clearly which of the two has the preeminent position, the dominant position, and he calls it his inner man, his spirit, his regenerated self that wills, that recognizes, that delights, that desires to do God's will. How do you know which thing is dominant? Well, it's the thing that desires to do the right thing in him. So in effect he's saying the flesh is a power, it's a force, it's a resistor that frustrates these desires, but it is not the dominant force in the Christian's life. The dominant force wants to do the law, wants to do what is right, wants to please God, and the sinful flesh is in opposition to that. Thirdly, he concedes that this struggle will continue throughout his lifetime. You know, he says, I'm a prisoner and must accept the situation. He accepts it. This is the way it is. This is the way it's always going to be. Verse 24 and 25, these final verses in the section here, he summarizes what he has explained in the last few verses. You know, Paul he does that, he, explain, you know, he tells you what he's going to say, he explains it in detail, then he tells you again what he said. So verse 24 and 25, he says, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? So this is a kind of like an impossible situation. This is a wretched situation to be continually denied the desire of the inner man by the sinful influence of the flesh. You know, I've described this in different ways. You know, there's always a fly in the ointment. You ever notice that? No matter what you do, no matter what good you try to do, there's always a part of it that's just not okay. You give you know, and you, you do something which is totally spiritually minded. Uh, it's totally about generosity, doing it in the spirit of Christ and so on and so forth. And then in the back of your mind, the idea comes, yeah, and it's probably making me look pretty good too. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, <laughs> oh, when's that you know, sinful, egotistical, self-serving, selfish, egocentric, when's that guy going to die once and for all? Imagine 2,000 years ago, right? We, we, we can relate, we can relate. So what's the solution to this problem? Well, the punchline, verse 25. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God. But on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. So the solution is twofold. One, Jesus Christ, right? All in one word. He compresses everything down to one word or one you know, name. Paul does not explain all that Christ does to help us. He's already done that for several chapters. He simply says that the solution is in Jesus Christ. And when we get to chapter eight, verse one, he's going to describe how God helps us deal with this struggle. But for now, he simply describes the struggle. So the solution is Jesus Christ and then acceptance. 
The struggle is painful and it's frustrating, but it is easier to bear once it's accepted for what it is. I accept there's always a fly in the ointment. I accept that you know, the sinful flesh is always going to be fighting my spirit. I accept that it's difficult to live the Christian life the way I imagine it ought to be lived. I accept that it's always, I don't quit on it. I don't give up, but I do accept that this struggle is going to be there. You know, you know, be there at a certain intensity. Sometimes it's not so intense. Sometimes it's tremendously intense. Depends what's going on in our lives, right? So Paul explains simply that as a regenerated man, he serves God and he does so with honesty and sincerity, with his spirit. And when he sins, the flesh is responsible. It's not what he wants, but it happens. Now again, I say this is not to absolve him of responsibility, but rather to confirm the existence of both entities and which one influences his obedience and which one influences his disobedience. Because we know there are people in the world, they're obeying the sinful flesh. You know, before I became a Christian, there was no struggle. <laughs> there was no struggle at all. It was just whatever I want, I'm going to figure out how to get that. No struggle there. They don't like it, too bad. That seems a little shady, oh well. No struggle there. That's what he talked about in, in seven. But then the law came and said, this is wrong, that is wrong, this is wrong, you're going to die, you're going to hell. Woo, hold on, wait a minute, what do I do now? You see, that's when the struggle starts. Okay, so from this then, uh, I think there's several lessons that we can draw from these two chapters that can be applied to our own lives to, uh, today. First lesson, this is every Christian's struggle. Don't think that Paul was unique or that his struggle was more intense than the average Christian of today. As a matter of fact, take comfort in the fact that Paul the apostle who heard and saw Jesus who was given the power to do miracles, who wrote the majority of the New Testament. You know? When it comes to sin, he had the same problem that we have. I take comfort in that fact. You know, in my own life as a minister, I, I can't even come close to achieving what Paul the Apostle did. You know? I mean, who can do that? And yet he, he fought the same things that I fight. So what he describes is the normal struggle that each one of us experiences as we try our best to serve Christ and we see how short we fall at times. Of course, it's not an excuse for being lukewarm, but it does help us to understand why even knowing and wanting to do our best for Christ does not always guarantee the results that we desire. Why? Because the flesh also has its say. Our spirit says, well, I'm going to do this for the Lord and this for the Lord. I'm taking that away. I'm getting rid of this. You know, I'm doing all those things. And the flesh says, oh yeah, over my dead body you will. And the stronger this side becomes, the more noticeable this other side becomes. That's the thing. Number two, this particular struggle is really a sign of life. You know, don't be discouraged if what you see in Christ is not always what you accomplish in Christ. The fact that you see, the fact that you desire, the fact that you hurt is the proof that Christ is in you and that you are truly a regenerated person. The lie that the, that the devil will try to you know, uh, whisper to you is, it's not worth it. Why try? It's not worth it. You're never going to be that good. You know, why? Why even try? Why, why? Just skate. Let it go. It's impossible. 
The unregenerated man, whether he is an unbeliever or calls himself a Christian, he is always easy to spot. No struggle, no struggle in his life, her life, no struggle at all in the inner man. And then one more, God will provide. Although he only mentions it briefly in chapter seven, Paul knew that God would and did provide for his struggle. And that's what chapter eight is about. Chapter eight is, I find, one of the most encouraging chapters in the entire Bible in any book. Because Paul describes the things that the Holy Spirit does to help us with this very issue, this very problem right here. And, and a lot of times people you know, will read chapter eight or will preach on chapter eight or teach chapter eight out of context. Chapter eight is the answer to chapter seven. You have to understand chapter seven if you're going to make sense of chapter eight. It just doesn't stand there all by itself. Okay? So God provides help and encouragement in this life so that we don't lose hope or desire for the next life. It's easy to become discouraged. And he provides a promise of eternal life so that we know that one day, one day the struggle will be over. Finally, it's done. Wouldn't it be great getting rid of this, getting, it, getting rid of this, uh, this sinful flesh, finally. I've said this before, I mean, the thing about heaven that, that I look forward to so, so much, no sin, no sin in me, no sin in you, no sin anywhere. Won't that be wonderful? Oh my, just that, never mind the rest of it, just that alone is worth going there. It's worth going there. Imagine a life, us, if we could live a life where there was no sin at all. Wouldn't need armies, wouldn't need police. We, you know. <laughs> We're a person, you could count on a person to tell the exact truth, to always do the right thing. Kindness would just be a, as a, a matter of fact. We wouldn't see it as a great, you know what I'm saying, a great showing. It was just, yeah, isn't everybody kind and generous? So be happy and rejoice in your struggle between uh, brethren rather, knowing that it's a sign and a promise of your salvation now and to come when Jesus our Lord returns. He, he's coming for the faithful and the faithful are the ones that are, you know, that, that are recognized that continual struggle within them. Okay, we're going to stop right here because then chapter eight, we have to take that in one, one bite and we don't have time to do both. So we're going to stop right here and we're going to pick up next week if the Lord is willing in chapter eight. Thank you for your attention.